the Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization, Dong Yu Xu. Could you please uh, give him a big hand for being here? Thank you. And, Thank you. and Dong Yu, there are uh, people in the, uh, in the uh, virtual world from uh, across the SDSN network globally watching as well. So we have both an in-person uh, uh, greeting for you and a worldwide greeting for you. Uh, the Director General of FAO is uh, really a remarkable leader. We're going to learn a lot. I always do every time we sit down. We, I was just learning uh, in the back uh, about wetlands. Uh, I, maybe he'll tell us a, a bit about that. But he is a, a terrific, really a great scientist. Uh, and he was uh, the uh, uh, vice Pre president, president is the yeah, yeah vice president of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, he's been a senior figure in China's agriculture, which has uh, got stupendous successes, many of which he has developed and promoted. And Deng Yuxiu became the director general of the Food and Agriculture Organization in 2019, and he did it because he won a worldwide campaign saying we can bring scaled changes to agriculture for sustainability, for food security, for nutrition, for environmental, biodiversity, sustainability, for quality of life. So a holistic vision at scale. And I've watched him put that into effect because his management style is to think big and bring everyone together. We had before you in the starting in the morning, Gerd Mueller from UNIDO. Yeah. He said he wants UNIDO to help on the food and agriculture sector. And I said, uh, of course, that's the natural partnership with you because yeah. they do the industrial uh, transformation side of things. And uh, I thought that was very exciting. And then President Shisekedi, who was here an hour ago, said that agriculture scaling up for the DRC is absolutely essential. So we're going to hear a phenomenal lesson, I guarantee you, uh, in uh, the uh, scaling up of sustainable agriculture and solutions to the world's challenges of poverty, hunger, rural livelihoods, and uh, agricultural production and uh, uh, food security. So thank you so much for being here. It's an incredible, oh, by the way, when he ran for re-election, of course, it was overwhelming support for <laughs> being re-elected in 2023 because of his tremendous success as Director General. So we're very honored that you're here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you know, the Professor Jeff Sachs, not only famous in Colombia, he is the famous in the world. You, you can trust me, eh? Because not only from the media, and from the ground, and a lot of politicians and farmers and the scientists that know Colombia through him. Yeah? So that's a real legacy asset for Colombia. And I'm honored to be friend with uh, Professor so many years. So I learned from him, from his vision, his uh, critical uh, point. It's very important because we are scientists. I, before joining FAO, I was a natural scientist on the genetics and the breeding for about 25 years. So I really enjoy my previous life. Of course, now I enjoy the, my current life to help the more people through our enabling policy science innovation, and a responsible investment. So I will share with my uh, thought. How many minutes are you? As long as you would like. No, we are professor. You gave me five minutes, I talk five minutes. You gave me 50 minutes, I talk 50 minutes. How about uh, 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes? Is OK, perfect. thank you. Perfect. Thank you for your generosity. <laughs> I, will, I will stay here. Uh, and. They, yeah, they have some slides to follow. Dear my uh, professor, Jeff Sachs, uh, so exciting to come to this uh, famous university as my humble 
as a director general. So it's my first time to stand the stage to give some kind of academic lecture or since I become FADG. So I made a special reservation for Columbia University for my friend. Because I got so many invitations to get, I said, no, I wanted to give my first most to you and to this university. <laughs> I wanted to start with a small uh, review or, or, or memory, small history towards, you know, why the food and culture so touch America, America government and America people. Because the only UN special agency was initiated by the president of America, at that time, President Roosevelt. And it was established the first meeting, United Nations Conference on Food and Culture in Hot Spring, Virginia. 1943, May 19 to June 3rd. Of course, during the war, the war, and so many people suffered from starvation. That time, I think 90% of the population. And that's why it's so important that President Roosevelt with other funding members from China, from Canada, from uh, Latin America, from South Africa, Europe, Asia. And so, and if it was uh, officially established under the UN, it's become the first UN special agency. So that's why the FAO Buster is October 16. And now, maybe some of you famous to know, now for the, the uh, World Food Day. That's pick it up FAO Buster, official Buster. So, uh, and that's what we should not forget. And then, of course, fortune, we start the first the DG is uh, also renowned scientist on the nutrition, nutritious. That's why the FO, we always talk about the food security and the nutrition security. Yeah, and from early on, he set the tone of FO Mende and the beans. And I, I'm so fortunate to become number nine FO DG back to another scientist. <laughs> I'm a scientist on the genetics and the breeding and culture in general, yeah? So it's some one cycle after 75 years. And agro food systems, where we are and where we need to be. That's I want to show, share my thought freshly, shortly with this 50 minutes. And you see, overarching driver of agro food system, population, Dynamics and urbanization, industrialization, and also digitalization. That uh, is above all, not only about the culture, about the economy. Uh, all the sector of economy and social and uh, in, in fact, globally by urbanization, industrialization, and uh, digitalization. So all we have to transform agrofuel based on that bigger scenario. Otherwise, we lost ourselves uh, on the middle way. Yeah? But also, world food insecurity. The reality is we, especially pandemic, heat, and uh, other uh, crises, and uh, also the man-made crisis, natural crisis, the war in Ukraine. So maybe they reversed, or, or economists always say off a track. But actually, still a lot of people I don't want to repeat all these numbers because you can search on the web from FO uh, flagship publications online. Because since I come to FO, I established a digital FO. Everything, including the photo uh, with uh, your dean, with uh, Professor Jeff Sachs, I think uh, 30 minutes later, you, will search, you can download from FO website. So, and uh, annually we publish several articles, uh, Sophia, Sofa, uh, Coffee, all related to commodities, uh, fishery, forestry, and uh, even last year we first published uh, studies of situation in rural women. So we look at all the angles and the areas related to agriculture and the food and the rural development. But the daunting situation, 
is still we have more than uh, 600 million people, even by 2030, are uh, suffering from starvation or, or hunger in general, uh, or malnutrition. And the health deaths, even more people still not affordable, 2.4 billion. And of course, look the figures here, world prevalence or undernourishment of the number and the undernourished people. It's, it was a, somewhere between the year of the 2011 to the 2018, it's, it was the lowest uh, during past years and, and about the, since 2000, this 2015. So it's about the uh, 20 years already. And it's climbing during the past three years. It's quite complex. And, and not only because the uh, uh, international uh, uh, bond or sanction, disruption of the supply chain, but also the pandemic, and, and also the human-made the crisis, not only war in Ukraine and in Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, and Haiti, you name it. Oh. So I think that all this, uh, and also the uh, food is, in general, is available. So food availability is, in general, is not a big problem, but food accessibility, food affordability, uh, everywhere. Even in the richest country in the world, they still have a big number of the people uh, have no money to buy food, to access food, to affordable food. And that's the projection of the global number of unnatural people. So you can see, I hope, best day, uh, scenarios will be, uh, by 2030, it's less than 500 million, but probably, most probably around uh, 600 million will be still suffering from the malnutrition. And of course, we, we have to repeat, say, unsafe food affect the uh, one out of 10, high food loss uh, should be, that's how I, you know, uh, expect it. That's our target. By the 2050, I think uh, Professor Jeff Sachs was very familiar with this also target when you, be the special advisor to the that secretary of Pan Ki Moon that time, I think. And so all the target is setting there, but off of track and the reverse even. Uh, and especially look the uh, the health deaths still it's not so much increase. Uh, and but the others increased too much, but it's not good because. Uh, 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 Non-communicable disease is come from the obesity and overweight. And stunning among children should be uh, needed to be decreased significantly. We should recover from lost decade in the rural poverty. So that's why they, uh, on Monday, the SDG summit, they, they, it's a political declaration is to give the clear message to recite, recharge, and re-emphasize. That's the common science now the, during this summit. And of course, agri-food system sustainability, we should examine holistically, and the holistic vision come with a potential synergy between the dimensions and the trade-offs. Agri-food system excessive pressure on the environment, of course, climate change is there, but the agriculture is a suffer from pollution, and also it's contributed to the gas emission, and especially from the subsect of the livestock and some others. And also biodiversity loss is so much because based on FAO professional assessment, it's 80% of uh, threatened the terrestrial species are in danger due to the land use chain driven by the agriculture. In general, agriculture includes the forest yeah, uh, uh, management and, uh, and uh, not only crop and fishery, land and water management, and what scarcity is. That's why the FAO last uh, minister conference in July in Rome, we focus on the water management. Not only water scarcity, uh, water flooding, and water pollution. 
There are three areas we should look at at the same time. And pollution from the industry, and the pollution not only to the uh, land, lake, rivers, and also Maria for the long term. So that's we have to, uh, to be more carefully look at the current situation. Just uh, before this uh, uh, lecture, uh, I had a, a very substantial discussion with the dean. How the map in the wetland, what is the emission, SNR emission from the wetland globally, because they have a man-made wetland, like a petrous field, we have also natural wetland from riverside, from lakes, from uh, uh, share of, uh, 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 of the coast regions. So all this, we have to, it's a challenge, but also it's opportunity, yeah? Also, again, because the time limit, I don't want to read all the details uh, information. If you like, you can, you can download it. Eh? <laughs> uh, and uh, that's a homework for the student, for someone who is interested. And the carbon neutralization is the only solution. I said the industrialization and urbanization, digitalization. But the first, we should aim into carbon neutralization improve the red dots, and increase the uh, blue dots or green dots, reduce the red dots, that's uh, the solution. Uh, we needed a package of solution, improve the, all the related areas. Agrophysical strategy, what is we should go on? What is the real solution for? We need a growth, yeah? And uh, that's why the, with my colleagues, since I come, I, through the, international consultation with the different members, country and academy people, private sectors, uh, civil society, and we come up with the four batters. Better production, better nutrition, better environment, better life for all, leaving no one behind. That's covered all the different type of countries at the different stage of the development. Let's hear Great America, you are developed countries, but you need a better production to improve your productivity. Produce more with less. Yeah, we need more food, definitely. But how? Produce more, more quantity, high quality, more food diversity. In Asia, especially Far East Asia, Southeast Asia, we enjoy so much food diversity. So let's produce more. And with less, less input. Not only fertilizer, chemicals, water, you name it, and also less negative impact on the environment. So that means better production, better nutrition. Also, not only nutritious food, we need more edible fibers, vegetables, fruit, and also more balanced formula, and also good the, uh, habits or consumption patterns. And that's better nutrition, and not only for poor, and also for rich people. That's, and then the better environment, not only for general environment, and also agro environment, and also you are a living environment, uh, and that's a real better environment which agriculture, forestry, horticulture, you can name it, livestock, all this area of fishery, we can contribute to the uh, better environment, and then end up with a better life, not only livelihood improved, better life, life quality at a different stage, yeah? Professor, we are a little bit senior, but not, but each, but we're still young at heart, right? And we need the health life. And what is health life based on the science, based on nutrition, based on the proper consumption and with uh, others. So, uh, and we need to uh, accelerate innovation, technology, data, complement the governance, human, Capital institution. If you are interested, you can visit the FA website. We have uh, released this uh, document uh, about uh, two years ago. But you look at the, all the linkage between four beds with, uh, with SDGs uh, and SDG 16 uh, and 17 is a partnership. So we build up the hand in hand initiative. We include uh, uh, all the key partners from the public, uh, private, Academy, a civil society, not only UN system and the international cooperation. We need to work all the key partners together, and then each SDGs we need a holistic design, 
and how to work with other SDGs because the nature is not divided by uh, SDGs or 17 or, or 20. It's even in the small community, you, you need the holistic design. Yeah? Uh, and of course, COVID-19 pandemic come and the other crisis, the war in Ukraine, and all this, it's really early warning for this planet, for our human being, but we have found the solution based on science, based on the scale deliverable, not based on the demonstration pilot project. That's what the scientist or professor is interested. Yeah, we need to start that pilot and a small demonstration, but for the social, economic, environment movement, we need a scale, deliverable, tangible results. That's why I always strengthen collaboration with the local government and the national government. And FAO is ready to work with all the key partners, with the university, with the academy, with the private sector, with the civil society, of course with the government and others, your uh, agencies. Why FAO is now is become more and more important? Because our funders uh, and our funding members, we started build on the food security. Yeah? and the nutrition, and also look at the agriculture at large. It means related to environment, related to life. And we can do more together. And that's why since I come, I started to change FL, restructure FL. We established three layers. First is the functional divisions. It's a pillars of FL and all the uh, related, and their office to coordinate the internal, external. And then we have uh, all this uh, platform. I established a World Food Forum for welcome all the partners and the key players that come to debate, to share your experience and knowledge, and also bring the uh, resources and uh, capacity buildings to the members. And all the members, ministers, uh, uh, and the relevant uh, partners come to FO to promote their own uh, project, initiative, whatever. So FAO become a knowledge sharing center and become the open platform to advocate the new science, new technology, and also new partners to build it. It's a matching, making place for you. So welcome all the students graduate from Columbia University, others, to use the FAO not only as an internship, as a resource of knowledge products. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much and for showing us how FAO is being uh, really uh, made into the central integrative hub for all of the issues around farming, nutrition, land use, biodiversity, because we need that integrated vision and uh, the UN system sometimes either leaves out major areas or parcels them out in a way that they don't get integrated and FAO is doing exactly what is so vital, which is bringing together all of these different components. So I really uh, congratulate you and also say that at Columbia University we have uh, tremendous uh, uh, interest and capacities in this area. My colleague Glenn Denning, uh, whom I think you know, uh, uh, our uh, lead in teaching uh, food policy and agricultural policy uh, in uh, the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, and um, we would love to support you in every practical way uh, and uh, to engage in uh, all of this uh, really thrilling work. I want to ask you, uh, from your perspective as Director General of FAO and your previous uh, leadership in China, I know you were assigned uh, the challenge of upgrading agriculture in one of China's poorest regions. Uh, and you made a major contribution there. And a lot of your members are asking you in very poor settings, well, what can we do? 
Yeah. And you did that in Ningxia. Yeah. Uh, so could you say a few words for in a low income setting where the people are in agriculture and perhaps uh, just subsisting, what is the right approach and what institutions, government, uh, the farmers associations, uh, the individual farmer, uh, and FAO, how can we put the pieces together to tell these uh, poor regions, here's how you can approach this scaling up problem? Okay, I have a... Oh, yeah, you do. That's so, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. It's, uh, it's a complete question, but I want to make it simple <laughs> and uh, mention several key points. First, of course, poor. Uh, different uh, region, different uh, even uh, counties, uh, different country. Poor, they have a root cause. Some members, some countries, some are depend on the uh, natural resources for agricultural and food production is not so ideal, like uh, near East. But when I went to the poorest province in China, Ningxia is a Muslim autonomous uh, region. The weather is harsh. The rainfall annually is uh, 200 millimeter. So, a lot of people look the, I'm a scientist, huh? so I look the holistic way. Drought is not good for cropping, for sure. <laughs> Even not good for grass. But drought, one advantage. Also not good for disease to grow, right? And then you can develop the livestock because you have no disease infection. The first, most, we encourage to develop the livestock. Yeah, livestock, you need the uh, uh, buildings inside, give the limited uh, water supply, and, and then keep the much clean. But the tropical, subtropical, rain fed areas, it's not good for that because there's so much uh, uh, microorganisms also growing flourish. So we have to change the way of thinking. Yeah? Jump out the uh, transition box. And then water saving, because years and years, transition want to have enough uh, grid supply. Grid is, uh, in that area, it depends on irrigation, it's a lot of water consuming crop. So, first, change the mindset. Second, find the proper commodities which are value added, complemented to other regions. Not that you, you, you don't, you are not allowed to use your disadvantage condition compete with some variable. It's, in my opinion, not the wise. Huh? So <laughs> that's the second. Third, you need a science support. First is the water in that they uh, salted the lake. It's not drinkable. So local farmers, local people don't like the, ah, oh, that's a lake is useless. But pH value more than 8.5, it's a good place to grow the high quality of fish. But you need the select proper species of fish to grow, like a sea, like a sea water. So people, they can catch fish from sea, even develop the aquaculture in the sea, or near east, near coast. But if we were growing the fish in that salted the lake, it was, so you turn the negative to the positive, uh, impact. That's also that. And uh, last but not least, you need the government uh, to support first. Because no any individual farmers or farmers are just that. The government, the raw issue that they give, they create the examples, create the hope. And then the private sector will follow. Because, oh, private, the, it's open a new window for them. And last but not least, uh, you have to establish an enabling policy, attract the investment. Because any poor country, poor region, they have no money. Definitely. Poor families. <laughs> that's a definite. Uh, and that's why I started NFL one country, one priority pr products initiative. Any country, small, small seeds, or LDC, LDC. So last time I met the president of Malawi, I said, you ask your minister, your local government. They are so poor, but focus on one. And then they build a whole value chain, not only production, then. and they make money, and they can make copy another pro proper uh, uh, crops or animal product or fishery fish uh, species. So that's uh, the solution. I think now through the handling, through the one country, one priority product, 
and the digital validation, all this come together. And then you can sign in online, but you need to introduce international standards. So Cortex hosted by FAO 60 years. How to use Cortex to scale up, speed up the high quality production and the development? It's not a negative. Eh? So a lot of people co consider the high standards will be blocked their op opportunity. No, if you jump out, you can leap the development. So this is, I hope everybody is uh, hearing very clearly what the answer to the question, this development of an aquaculture industry, it starts with vision but the vision based on a scientific insight and the local ecology. Yeah. Well, this isn't the place to grow this crop, this isn't the place to grow this crop, this isn't the place to grow this crop, and this lake which you think is useless, that is your <laughs> new income source if you think yeah. what's really possible. Yeah. And then I, I want to underscore because I think it is so essential and in my view, China has proved this time and again. When you have that strategy, it doesn't just implement itself. It's not good enough to say this is a good place for aquaculture. You need to create two things. You need first the government to help lead so that because in impoverished community, they can be, they can have the idea, but they can't implement it without resources to start. Almost everything requires an investment at the beginning, yeah. and then come the results later. Yeah. But investment up front when you're impoverished is not easy. Yeah. So you need the government there to start the process, and then, as the Director General said, an enabling environment. And that means all of the rest of the ecosystem of transport, regulation, yeah. uh, guidance, uh, and so forth, so that this new industry comes together. I love the idea. I was with the president of Malawi yesterday, uh, President Chakwera, yeah. and he absolutely said, we must develop agriculture. So he's <laughs> listening to you. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a natural partnership uh, where you can make a breakthrough because Malawi wants it, needs it, the president is very intelligent, very determined, uh, and uh, I know that that can make, make a huge difference for them. Yeah, that, that's why they I, I committed and determined to come to FAO, because I want to share not only my personal experience, also 40 years experience accumulated in China during the open door and the reform or transform, agro food system and the rural development. I think it's a smallholder farmers. I come from the smallholder farmers family. My family, eight people, only 14 more, not the 15 more. 15 more equal one hectare. Slight, one more less. But we have to make life. Uh, President Lula asked me, why, how? I said, yeah. But you're a politician, oh, you need the horizontal. You're an economist. A lot of people think the horizontal way, expanding, expanding, from one hectare to 10 hectare. If we give me 10 hectares, we'll have enough food. No, you only have one hectare. How to build up a vertical, wow. vertical uh, uh, solution. For instance, give you 1,000 square. Uh, if I come to your campus, I ask you 1,000 square, I can make rich. How? Build a one ten stores of the plastic house, not need a greenhouse because no heating necessary in the winter, but you can, I can start building the sprout vegetables, 10 stores. And the, within two weeks, I can deliver to the hotels. Use the, all the less germinated quality of seeds. It's all the garbage from the seed company. And the sprout vegetables, you name it, the plastic oresia or, or, or tacon or even peanuts, sprout of peanuts. I can sell you one square meat, two dollars. I can make one dollar profit. <laughs> Only uh, spring water. So you need the business model change based on science. Science is you can make it rich and uh, 
and the happiness. Science is not only a scientific paper, printed or, or not online in the headlines of a scientific journey. <laughs> this is incredible. And uh, we were also reflecting this morning that this coming year, of course, President Lula is president, is the host of the G21. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this gives, I think, you also a great opportunity to uh, work with him. And I told him yesterday we will completely support him, and he asked for the support to really make his presidency the world scale up of yeah. these ideas. Yeah. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. You met with him and Yes, him I well. had a long discussion with him. And uh, we have a passion. We say he's from poor family and from first FODG from a smallholder farmers. I'm the first one. <laughs> I grew up from a small valley. The commonality. So we have to be survivor first. So first time I had enough food because we planned the hybrid rice in 1973 when I was 10 years old. Because they increased about 50% of a year to compare the conventional rice that time. Yeah, so one hectare equal two hectare. <laughs> now South South cooperation between FAO have them in Africa, Madagascar or Uganda or others, introduce a new technology, new varieties. The land of Africa alone, they can feed at least the two billion or three billion people based on current technology. But we need the investor input, the irrigation systems, the soil mapping, and then we can use the fertilizer more efficient, more consistent, more sustainable way. That's why FO we say support the members, the agrophysical transformation more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable. Not only sustainable. I know you are, you are, you are a father of the sustainable <laughs> but, uh, development, but a we, story. we need you know, the efficiency which produce more and with less. More inclusive means also share the development with, uh, with all the key, uh, families, the communities. And the more resilient, you need the investment in the rural areas to improve the precondition of agricultural food system production and the storage post harvest. Yeah. So that's a food loss that you can reduce dramatically, yeah, easily. 30, 40 percent loss before they reach the storage. And then for the West, also, that's why FAO we advocate the food loss and the waste day, 29th of September each year. Uh, and that's also, it's a marginal utility, is the highest action globally. S reduce the food loss, stop food waste. I'd like to, in closing, first to, to recognize, if I could, you have a wonderful team here, and I want to pay uh, tribute to your chief economist, if I could, because uh, economist to economist. Uh, Maximo Torero, uh, really a great uh, leader and supporter of all of this effort. So I really want to thank uh, Maximo for also all of the wonderful collegiality and, and the leadership. And I, I'd like to ask Glenn if he would uh, just say a word or ask a question, uh, because uh, Glenn Denning, you reminded me after the Cambodian disaster uh, in the 1970s, Glenn helped get Cambodian agriculture up and running again with, uh, with Erie uh, and uh, replanting seeds that otherwise had been lost, but they had been saved, uh, stockpiled. So uh, just, uh, Glenn, just to say a word and, uh, with the... Uh, I, I won't climb up on the stage, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I it's very difficult to say any more than uh, what the Director General has, has already said. Uh, but I'd really sort of underline how important it is for FAO's leadership at this time. And as the headlines have been screaming, uh, we have a food crisis like no other. There's no question about that. If you, and, and, and FAO's own statistics, the undernutrition coupled with what I call, uh, uh, incorrectly probably, the overnutrition uh, and all of the uh, diseases that come with that, we're really looking at a world where about half of the world's population, as many as four billion people, are not getting it right in terms of the diet. 
combining these two and even allowing for some overlaps. So it really is a crisis like no other. And everybody's aware of this now. Why? Because of the price of food and, and the way it's been increasing. And, and especially now in, in, in Asia uh, with rice uh, really spiking. Uh, so again, a huge role for FAO in terms of policy support. We have countries that are panicking right now and even some exporters are saying, well, we're gonna stop exporting. And all that does is trigger further, uh, you know, crisis as a, you know, as a result. Um, we've got a number of countries, I think, scrambling to ensure food security in their own countries, sometimes doing it well through social protection programs, less well in terms of price caps. Uh, so this, this is the time when FAO's role is more important than ever. And, uh, you know, I, it, it's not just uh, Asia, of course, Africa, but as you point out very correctly, there's great potential in Africa for intensification um, and to do it sustainably. Uh, to feed two billion, three billion people is absolutely possible. A country like DRC, this morning the president talked about the, the, the challenge of productivity there. The yields haven't changed in 50 years in DRC. If you look at the core staple foods, so much can be done. So, you know, I, all I would say is, you know, more power to FAO uh, and, and working with countries to, I think, create platforms whereby the policies can be coherent across countries so it's not making matters worse. Um, learning, providing a way of learning from, from positive experiences and also some negative experiences. Um, and yeah, I mean, being here to, as, as you rightly pointed out, we're not going to hit the SDG2 by 2030, but we should be at least thinking about what can be done 2035, 2040 and beyond. And there's a big role for FAO there. Thank you. Thank you. So, let me uh, thank you very, very much for being here. If, if this is your first lecture, you're not rusty at all. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it was really, uh, it's, it's such an honor to work with you uh, with your re-election uh, by uh, worldwide uh, demand. Um, we have uh, the time with your leadership in the next few years to really make these breakthroughs. And I think politically, what we're seeing at the UN this week is uh, the realization, even the grudging realization of great powers that there is no alternative but to work together. Uh, and I heard that from President Biden yesterday, I was happy to hear that. Uh, the United States said, okay, we know, we have to partner with everybody on the SDGs. This was uh, good news and a good speech and President uh, Lula gave a wonderful call to action and here you are, a person uh, that's going to lead the action. So thank you, thank you so much. Before I leave, I used to your holy stages uh, make the two short comments. First, I'm so happy, you know, uh, with uh, my colleagues, highly qualified uh, colleagues supporting me. Not only uh, chief economist, chief scientist, also ADG from DDG from the United States and uh, from all the world. That's one big team. Eh? Without the high qualified the team to, and also appreciate all the members support me. FAO, first time in the history, not only because of pandemic, because of the crisis, the war in Ukraine, we faced so much challenge, but the first time in the history we are build the one FAO, and with a strong solidarity. In that aspect, I really appreciate the America government relevant uh, agencies, university, not only uh, uh, Columbia, uh, also Mississippi or others support me. It's a one FAO, one solidarity. I, support, I got support from China, uh, Japan, and Europe, Africa, of course, Latin America, you name it. Uh, and uh, also some even, you know, small state. I said, in Chinese, we always joke. And, and, A-N-T. Ant meat is a meat. Elephant meat also is a meat, no matter big or small. So I really appreciate big or small contribution. But the, here in America, I should publicly say, America during the past four years, no any dollar delay, and 
double the volunteer contribution. Japan also, China of course, and Europe also still keep increase. So I manage in that during challenge time quite a well, and we can do more and better. I know there are so much and high especially from FL, from myself. I will keep around. Thank wow. you. <laughs> Thank you so much.